Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. I'm Vincent Rougeau, Dean and Professor at Boston College Law School and Director of the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to say how excited I am about the launch of BC's Forum on Racial Justice in America. This timely university-wide initiative is an important step forward as we strive to dismantle institutional and structural racism and work for racial justice. We've had a number of events this month to launch the forum's work, and I'm very excited to be part of this important event tonight. The forum will take a three-step approach to engage and address the pervasive issues of racism and racial injustice that exist across our country. These stages are modeled on the process of observe, judge, and act, a pillar of Jesuit pedagogy. My hope is that our work within the forum will act as a catalyst for bridging differences, promoting reconciliation, and encouraging new perspectives. I feel a great deal of optimism due to the support of the Boston College community, including Dean Gennaro and the Canal School of Nursing, who are sponsoring this event and bringing such a dynamic and engaging speaker to all of us tonight. So thank you, Dean Gennaro, and thank you, members of the audience, for joining us in our work to move forward as a more just society. It's a vitally important endeavor and one we can only accomplish if everyone gets on board. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Gennaro. Thank you, Dean Rougeau. And good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm Susan Gennaro and I'm the Dean of the William F. Cannell School of Nursing. It's my distinct honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kamar Phyllis Jones, whose presentation, Tools for Becoming a Racial Justice Warrior is an event I've really been looking forward to. It's also a great honor for the Cannell School to sponsor this event in collaboration with the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. As Dean Rougeau, the inaugural director of the forum, clearly said, the Forum on Racial Justice is an important addition to the Boston College community. It's a much needed, needed resource at a pivotal time. And I anticipate it becoming a pillar of the Boston College community for years to come. We come together tonight for the purpose of community. Not only do we share in the community of Boston College as students, faculty, parents, and friends, but more importantly, we share a belief of what com community can be. We believe in a community of inclusivity, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, age, socioeconomic status, or ability. And we are dedicated to building and maintaining this community's success. It's in that spirit that I welcome Dr. Jones and that I'm introducing her tonight, who will be joined throughout tonight's presentation by CSUN's Associate Professor, Department Chair, and Moderator for the evening, Dr. Elisa Harris. Dr. Harris will be asking audience questions to Dr. Jones, so please make sure to use the Zoom question feature to participate, and we'll also ask some of the questions that you submitted when you signed up for the event. We'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. But first, to our guest. Tonight, I have the true pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones, who has dedicated her career to championing, championing health equity. Dr. Jones is a family physician, an epidemiologist, and the past president of the American Public Health Association, whose work focuses on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on the health and well being of the nation. In her recent position as the Evelyn Green Davis Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, Dr. Jones worked to broaden the national health debate to include not only universal access to high quality health care, but to also call attention to the social determinants of health and the social determinants of equity. Dr. Jones is currently a senior fellow at the Morehouse School of Medicine and her past roles have included assistant professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, medical officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and president of the American Public Health Association. 
She is also an adjunct professor at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Dr. Jones has served on numerous professional boards and has been the recipient of many, many honors. She's known within the global community for her efforts to eliminate health disparities and to achieve health equity. We're pleased to have her speak at Boston College tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kamara Jones. Thank you so much, Dean Gennaro. And thank you very much, Dean Rougeau and Dr. Harris. I am delighted to be with all of you all uh, because it is exciting for me to, um, to be equipping future racial justice warriors. <laughs> That's exactly what we all need to be about. I'm going to share my screen and indicate that I want, I do want this to be a conversation. So I'm going to, ha I have some slides that include some of my stories and definitions and frameworks, and then we'll take a pause for your questions. And then I'll launch in and give you another allegory. And then we'll pause for more questions and then I'm going to help you. So I'm going to be equipping all of us with tools all along the way. But I really, really want you at any point when I say something and you're like, oh, I don't think so. Or you're like, oh, yeah, and I, we can embellish it that way or anywhere in between an amen, whatever it is, put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A function because I want to prioritize the conversation time we have right now, as opposed to just having you um, hear something that you might be able to go online and hear you know, that I may have said before. This is for you. So I'm gonna start out by saying that in 2016, when I was the president of the American Public Health Association, I used that opportunity and that platform to go big or go home, right? And I decided that I was going to launch our association on a national campaign against racism, not just our association, but as many other associations and communities, organizations as wanted to join us. And there were three tasks and our three tasks to this national campaign against racism. The first being to name racism, to say the whole word, because if we, don't name racism in our national context of widespread racism denial, we're complicit with that denial. Naming racism is essential. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need to then move beyond that to ask the question, how is racism operating here to identify levers for intervention, targets for action, and then we need to organize and strategize to act. When I, in 2016, launched this national campaign against racism, I did not know that in 2020, there would be so many cities and counties and states that actually made formal declarations of racism as a public health crisis. The first state, well, actually it was the county. So in the state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee County, in May of 2019, so this is before COVID-9, before all of that, and I am told as a direct offshoot of the work that I had done as APHA president, passed a formal declaration that racism is a public health crisis. I want you to look at this spread of ideas and how I just spread as we see that in July of 2019, Illinois joined, and then in August of 2019, November of 2019, December of 2019, May of 2020. So by May of 2020, COVID-19 has already hit. There are six states that have at least one city or county, or in some instances, the whole state, sometimes many, that have made these declarations. And then on May 25th, we had the very public lynching, I would say, of Mr. George Floyd, and boom, the country lit up. And it didn't stop there in June, July of 2020, September of 2020, even now in October, 2020, the last one, last time I looked, which was about a week ago, West Virginia had added at least one city or county or the state. This is what we have here. There are 131 jurisdictions in this country across 26 states that have formally declared racism to be a public health crisis. First of all, this talks about the importance of agenda setting. 
right? And so I'm going to encourage all of you who are within the sound of my voice to be brave and bold in your agenda setting. But it also begs the question, so what's going to happen because of these declarations, right? It is important for a city or a county to put a stake in the sand, to say we recognize that racism exists, hold us accountable, our you know, citizenry, hold us accountable for acknowledging racism and then moving to action. But what is going to be necessary for this to cause the dismantling of this system? So naming racism as these 131 jurisdictions have done so far and counting. When we name racism, there are four key messages that I want you to remember because I want you to be equipped to name racism and go out and have all kinds of conversations with strangers and friends, family and not so family. The first is that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that we can act to dismantle racism. So the whole rest of our conversation is going to equip you with tools to be confident in understanding and conveying these four key messages. The first tool is one of my allegories, one of my teaching stories that's based on something that happened in my own real life. This story I call Dual Reality, a restaurant saga, and I'll give you the moral already. This one is about racism exists. It, it struck, this, the story was stimulated by something that happened when I was a first year medical student. So you know, walk with me now. Here I am, first year medical student, very studious, you know, very diligent. Wake up on a Saturday morning early and what do I do? I hit the books, nose in the books, studying long and hard till mid afternoon when some friends come over. And do they distract me? Oh no, all of us get to studying long and hard and now it's getting late and we're getting hungry and I have no food in the apartment, which was typical for me. So my friends understood. So they said, "Never mind, Kamara, we need to go into town and get something to eat. So we do, we walk into town, we find a restaurant, we walk in, we sit down, menus are presented, we order our food, food is served, here we are eating. And you're like, Dr. Jones, that's not a very illuminating or remarkable story about racism exist. Well, no, not yet. But as I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now maybe I've intrigued you. And you're like, okay, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Oh yeah, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost some of you. So let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating I look across the room, I see a sign that says open, thinking nothing more about it. I would have assumed other hungry people could walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that now indeed the restaurant was closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I understood that racism structures open closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it's difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. But those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims clothes to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege 
not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why you can even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. And you can say, restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door and let them come in? You'll make more money and oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass food through the window. Or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or break through the door, but at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So this story, if I have four minutes to convey to people that yeah, racism exists, even though your whole life experience has screened open, this is the story that you know racism is structuring two-sided or multi-sided science. It's creating a dual or multifaceted reality. And of course, racism is not just the sign. It's the sign, it's the door, it's the lock. It's like there's a whole big system going on. And I actually started a three-hour conversation once by asking a group of people in Flint, Michigan. I just told the story, just like I told you, right? And I asked this question, how could people who are born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign. And we had a three-hour conversation because there are many, many ways to know. I have to say that today I am heartened that more people who were born inside the restaurant and maybe just, maybe in April, they would have been saying like, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter. Don't they know all lives matter? Are now affirming, yes, black lives matter. More and more people born inside the restaurant have seemed to have gotten a glimpse of the fact that there's a two-sided sign going on and they're putting together the word structural racism or systemic racism. This is important, it's heartening, but I have a warning. The staunch racism denial, which is the basal positioning in our nation is so seductive that if we just say a thing, put out a statement or whatever, name racism, affirm that black lives matter. If we just say a thing, the seductiveness of racism denial will turn into what I describe as the somnolence of racism denial. And we may forget in six months why we said that thing. So we must be, go beyond saying a thing to doing a thing, to acting. So we need to tear down the sign, dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges, because if we act, we will not forget why we're acting. But now I want to shift to a definition of racism because I've said the word a few times and different people might have different ideas about what it is. And in fact, I was speaking with Dean Rougeau just a little bit earlier and commenting that, you know, sometimes if you say the word racism, you can clear a room, right? <laughs> people will run because they think if you say racism, you're taking a close look at them and trying to figure out exactly how racist are you or, you know, trying to devise a room into who's racist and who's not. When I say racism, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. I am not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. And yes, even though racism can manifest in those things, I'm talking about racism as a system of power and a system of doing what? A system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured and on what basis is the value assigned? It's based on so-called race, which is the social interpretation of how one looks in a race conscious society. And you know, I used to do a one hour lecture on what is race. I'm not going there now. I just hope that everybody recognizes that race is not biology, that there is no basis in the human genome for racial subspeciation. We have mapped the human genome and we know that. So, and that race is not culture because these groups that we call races include many ethnic groups and you know different histories and languages and cultural practices and the like. And race is not social class, even though because of structural racism, and we'll go there in a minute, there is, unfortunately, an association between social class and race in this country. But what race is, is the social interpretation of how one looks in a race conscious society. And the same race that a medical admitting clerk might check off for me that might become a health statistic, right? Is the same race that a cab driver notices 
or a police officer or a teacher in a classroom or a judge in a courtroom. And it's that race that has profound impacts on our life opportunities and life exposures. So understanding that this socially assigned race is not biology, but it's the substrate on which racism has operated historically and continues to operate day to day to structure opportunity and assign value. What are the impacts of this system? Well, when we do think or talk about racism at all, we understand that racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in this country because it makes some people, especially some white people, uncomfortable. And you know, I've been doing these kinds of talks for decades now. And I used to say, if I was in a room and I felt people kind of, you know, did a little fidget, I would say, oh, but you know what? If you feel uncomfortable, shake it off, stay with me, I'll tell you some more stories. I don't say that anymore. What I say now is if you feel uncomfortable, I encourage you to lean into that discomfort because I have come to recognize that for each of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism, which many of us miss, and that is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So it's not just True, for example, that Black lives matter. Black lives are precious. Black lives are genius. Black lives are leadership and creativity and generosity and love. And when we constrain Black lives and when we constrain Latinx lives and when we constrain Indigenous lives and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander lives and Asian lives and all of these racialized, racialized lives, and when we constrain these lives either slowly by not vigorously investing in the full, excellent public education of all of our children, because the blinders of racism have made some decision makers feel like there is no genius in the barrios or the ghettos or on the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids, when in fact there is genius in all of our communities. And if we were to only vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation or a world. Or when we constrain these Black and Indigenous and other people of color lives slowly by being complacent, with what I describe as the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that didn't separate us from human potential. Or when we off these lives in an instant in a barrage of police bullets or with a police officer's knee, it is not just that we have lost that genius and the humanity in that individual, or even that we have forever fractured a family or a community we are sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. This is a very important aha. Before I leave this slide, I just wanna say one more thing, which is that when I talk about the unfair disadvantage and the unfair advantage, I have come to understand that there are many people in this country who think, yes, there are two states of being disadvantaged and normal. And the reason that there are many people who think that they're disadvantaged and normal is that we as a nation are ahistorical and people do not understand that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. So I would like to just pause right there after just a few minutes, this kind of little titillation stuff to see what do you have to say? What questions are in your mind? Uh, Let's talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. We do have a few questions from the audience. Um, so my first question would be, um, what would a policy that prevents institutional racism look like? What's the foundation and what are the building blocks? What building blocks could the education community contribute to? Um, and do you have any real world examples that we can model off? after. Okay, so um, I would say that if we're trying to achieve um, health equity, social equity, you know, if we're trying to dismantle not only racism, and I actually didn't 
say this, but that same definition I gave of racism can be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. So what is sexism? That's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, saps the strengths of the whole society. I know this is a, is a tangent, but I'm coming right back because, okay. So, and, and, and often I acknowledge that there are many axes of inequity operating in our society today. So they include, you know, gender, they include ethnicity and immigration status and, you know, uh, incarceration status and all of this stuff. And all of those things are axes of inequity with associated systems of structured inequity. Uh, and then people ask me with well, Dr. Jones, you know, you spend your whole career talking about race as the axis of inequity and racism as the system of inequity, and yet you're going to acknowledge all this other stuff going on intersecting in communities and in individuals. Yes, I acknowledge all of that. I focus on race as the axis of inequity and racism as a system because racism is foundational in our nation's history, and yet many people are in staunch denial of its continued existence and profoundly negative impacts on the health and well being of the nation. So I actually encourage all of us to become actively anti racist, even as we engage in those other systems. But I say that because when I talk about racism as a system of structured inequity, I recognize that it's the foundational one, it's the, the main one, the, the one that people are in denial of, and that we have to go there. But when we're talking about um, addressing institutionalized or structural racism, the same things that we need to do that we need to do for all of these things, which is to value all individuals and populations equally, we need to recognize and rectify historical injustices, and we need to provide resources according to need. Now, those are things that I often articulate as principles for achieving health equity, but they're the same principles that you need for achieving educational equity, social equity, you know, justice equity, so all of these things. So those three principles, if any of you all are trying to figure out if is my work about equity and achieving equity? Are you valuing all individuals and populations equally? Are you in fact investing in the people in a community who are already aiming, they're working to solve the, their own problems in their community? Are you recognizing that and investing in them? Are you elevating their voices? Are you engaging them in decision-making at the table? You know, is it that you're thinking you have my children versus your children, or are you valuing them all of our children as our children? I mean, many ways, if you just think about how do you use that word value, you know, you, when you value, you invest and in, you protect, you elevate, you, you know, you um, invite, you know, the, you could make a list of 50 value words. Are you doing that to all individuals and communities? So that's number one. The second, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. As I've already said, we as a nation are ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. We need to not only recognize historical injustices, but then rectify, which in the context of you know, the US right now, my first of four policy agenda items for the US is reparations to the descendants of Africans enslaved in the US, as well as full honoring of treaties with our indigenous North American nations, right? That's the number one. Um, I'll come back to the others because I want to just say, I don't want to spend so much time on this question, but the third thing of providing resources according to need. How do you do that? Well, first you need to develop a metric of need that everybody agrees to. Maybe it's infant mortality rate or maternal mortality rate, or maybe it's incarceration rate or reading levels, or maybe it's you know the death rates from COVID-19, whatever. We develop a metric of need, but even then, it's not so easy to provide resources according to need because it also takes political spine, right? And you might have a health director for a state with five counties who gets a million dollars. The first impulse is to give each county $200,000. Even though we've already developed this metric of need, that health officer needs to have the spine to say, well, County A, you are not gonna get any this year because County E needs that. And you may not get any next year or even the year after. So anyway, so those three principles. If I, do you want me to go back to just circle off the, what, my, what my agenda is for, um, so, so I've already said, we have to be careful that we don't fall back into the somnolence of racism denial six months from now. I intend, it is my job to make it hard for anybody to do that. So I'm going to continue this national campaign against racism with the three tasks going forward. I have four policy items in my, 
at the top of my agenda. Reparations, as I've said, and on, full honoring of treaties with our indigenous forebears. The second is decarceration, which some people like Angela Davis for, for decades has been talking about abolition of prisons. We can do better. The third is massive investment in communities of color. I've heard some people describe it as a Marshall Plan for investment in communities of color, investing in housing, investing in green space, investing in environmental cleanup, investing in people's businesses and banks and schools and all of this. And the fourth used to be a part of this, but I'm gonna say the fourth is especially massive investments around families and children with early childhood education and all. And we will know when we will have succeeded in all of this when the term disadvantaged child will have no meaning because we will not be able to even imagine a child born into disadvantage or finding themselves falling into disadvantage. That was a very long answer. I'll try to be briefer the next time. <laughs> That's all right. So a second question, um, how can a white person actively denounce racism and white supremacy in their everyday lives? What can we say or do to show our anti-racism and support for all people of color? So the first thing I'll say is anti-racism is not just support for all people of color, it's support for the nation because racism is sapping the strength of the whole society. That actually, if, of the three impacts of racism that I talked about, the unfair disadvantage at the individual or community level and the reciprocal unfair advantage and then how it saps the strength of the whole society. If I had to just pick one that we knew about right now, it would be that racism saps the strength of the whole society. So that is the first uh, realization that people who, who would want to think of themselves as allies in this, I, I welcome all of us, but I do not think that ally is exactly the right framing because if you're an ally, it's a little bit loose. And you know, maybe you have a vacation coming up, a two week vacation. And so then you say, well, you know, bye, check you in two weeks, hope the struggle goes well. No, so, so you know, we need to be compatriots, but then how can a white person step into that compatriot role? I hear the question, um, is to recognize and then use their white skin privilege, honestly. They, they need to name racism, first of all, and be unafraid to name it everywhere, and especially name it when they're in all white circles, when they're at that white board table or they're you know, in that admissions committee meeting or you know, wherever they're finding themselves or at their family dinner table and they're hearing something on the news or hearing something, somebody say something. And they need to, you know, a, a gentle way is to say, well, why did you just say that? Or um, have we considered you know, all of the strengths that this candidate brings that, that you guys are just like, you know, nerfing. So, um, you know, just kind of not even considering. So, um, and, and that's difficult. It's difficult for many white pe people to acknowledge white skin privilege. It's difficult um, because we usually recognize the closed signs in our lives and not the open signs. So you might have a white woman who is all about the closed sign because of her gender and not recognize that the other part of the restaurant is open to her because of her race. Um, I will say that white skin privilege does not protect people from poverty. White skin privilege does not protect people from homophobia, right? It doesn't protect you from everything, but it does give you the benefit of the doubt high expectations, safety <laughs> in many situations. And so let me just tell you a story, a quick story to illustrate how to do this. Um, you, it's so long ago now, I think it's about six summers ago in uh, McKinney, Texas, outside of Dallas, there was a group of young, like 12 and 13 year olds who were gonna celebrate one of their birthday in a pool in one of their neighborhoods. So they went to have the birthday celebration at this pool and there were people at the pool who objected to them being there, called the police. And what we saw was a young black girl being pulled by her hair by a white police officer who then sat on her. We saw young black boys sitting with their hands handcuffed behind their backs on the curb. And when I saw that, I was like, well, how do we even know about this? And people were like, oh, you know, social media. But I'm like, like how do we know about this? I got the answer the next day when I heard a young white boy being interviewed on a national news program saying, it's almost as if I were invisible to the police. He was part of the friend group. 
He saw what was happening to his friends. He could have run home for safety, but recognizing that his white skin privilege made him almost invisible to the police, he stood up there and he videotaped what was happening to his friends. He documented that. So what I say to people who are living as white, even though you would want to deny that you have white skin privilege, oh, don't give me that, don't put that on me, I'm with you, you know, yeah. no. If you are living as white in this country, you do have white skin privilege. Don't try to deny it, use it. And I could tell stories for six hours, six days, six weeks. And you, with a word, out of your white appearing self, could do more anti-racist than I could do in six weeks of storytelling. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more quick question. Sure. How do you get most policymakers on board with reparations? So somebody's asking I haven't help. done it yet. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. But I think history. I think that most people, if they understood the full history of this nation, would understand that a wrong had been done that needed to be recognized and then rectified. So my encouragement is for policymakers and for just regular people to learn our history, which is being obstructed actively by different curriculum committees in different states. Even right now, um, I don't know who's aware of these Office of Management and Budget uh, directives that are trying to limit this discussion of racism, uh, trying to, they say they're discussive of things that are termed divisive by race and gender, but oh my God, history is not divisive. There, there are people who are saying, oh no, the 1619 project, that's all bad. We need a 1776 project. No, we need to know our full histories. And once we know our full histories, then it's not convincing anybody, it will become apparent to everybody who knows the history that something needs to be done. So that's my short answer. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to resume my screen sharing. And um, this is just a little Zoom thing I have to do to get to where I had ended. And I know that we had questions from before and I hope that we're also addressing questions that you guys are putting in the, in the chat now. So I'm gonna give you one more tool for naming racism. And this one, uh, is my gardener's tale allegory. But first, before I tell you the story, I need to describe to you three levels of racism that when 25 years ago, because this is an old story, this is on the public health side of things, it's like a cult classic. But about 25, 30 years ago, I was trying to figure out how could racism turn into health outcomes? So how could racism turn into differences in asthma prevalence between different populations or communities? How could it turn into the differences in the numbers of our babies dying before their first birthday, which is the infant mortality rate? How could it turn into differences in the number of pregnant women or women just within a year of having been pregnant dying by race or ethnicity? How could racism turn into differences in obesity prevalence or diabetes prevalence or heart disease prevalence or kidney disease prevalence, all of these conditions now that are being recognized as the pre-existing conditions that make you more likely to die if you've been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, make you more likely to die from COVID-19. And I talk about three levels of racism, which at the time I described as institutionalized. Now, we would the term we would use for that level is structural. So every time I say institutionalized, I'm saying institutionalized or structural. The second level, personally mediated racism. Some people describe as interpersonal racism. I describe it as personally mediated because I am still so clear that racism is a system. And this is the system mediated through people and internalized. So let me define each of these levels of racism for you give you some illustrations of how they can impact health and then illustrate them and what we're supposed to do with my gardener's tale allegory. So institutionalized or structural racism, that's the system, if you will, that's the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms and values, which taken together result in differential access to the goods, services and opportunities of society by race. So this is the kind of racism that doesn't you know, require an identifiable perpetrator, right? Because it's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or it's reciprocal inherited advantage. 
We see structural racism in terms of material conditions as well as in terms of access to power. So differential access by race to quality housing or excellent educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities or even the same level of income at the same level of employment. And clearly those differences can impact health. Differential accesses, differential access to medical facilities, which could be physical access, proximity access, financial access, even linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment and the very well-documented disproportionate placement of toxic dump sites or bus transfer stations in communities of color. And with regard to power, differential access to power as information, which could be health information or even information about our own histories. Differential access to power as resources, not just capital resources, but social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board, and differential access to power as voice, voice in media and government and the like. And I have to point out that over years of sharing this framing, I have often been interrupted about now with a question, excuse me, Dr. Jones, but would you take a careful look at that top list of examples that you provided, housing, education, employment, income, Dr. Jones, isn't that what we call social class? Why do you have that on the slide about racism? Are you talking about racism? Or are you really, really talking about social class? This is a very important question, right? That many of you might be holding right now. So I am going to answer it. And the first part of my answer is the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That is not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized or stigmatized or oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice. So for example, for American Indians, the initial historical injustice was the taking of the land and the near genocide and then moving survivors to reserve lands. And then in some instances, something good was found under one reservation. Oops, you gotta pick the people up and move them somewhere else. For, there were there are families that have lived in Mexico for centuries, never crossed the border, but the border crossed them. And they find themselves in New Mexico and all of the Southwestern states. And now their great grandchildren are being harassed and targeted and vilified. The El Paso, um, Texas massacre just a little over a year ago. There are Chinese laborers who were brought to this country to build our railroads, unable by law to marry and unable by law to bring their families. Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II when we did not intern German Americans or Italian Americans. For people of African descent, the initial historical injustice was the kidnapping of West African people and our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage. And then for the survivors, and their progeny for generations and generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But then people are like, huh, Dr. Jones, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, we all recognize that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history. But Dr. Jones, the enslaved people, they were emancipated by 1865. We're in 2020. That makes it 155 years ago. Dr. Jones, all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? Well, the answer is in the question, isn't it? All else being equal. All else has not been equal since 1865 and all else still is not equal today. And there are what I describe as contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating that and all of those other initial historical injustices. And these present day contemporary structural factors are part and parcel of institutionalized or structural racism. So if you ask me, am I talking about racism or am I really talking about social class? My answer is that structural racism explains why we even see an association between social class and race in this country. And this is a very important aha. It doesn't just so happen. Now I have had people who say, well, but Dr. Jones, you know, you talk so much about racism and all, you don't care about poor white people, do you? I do indeed care deeply about poor white people and poor black people, poor Latinx people, poor indigenous people, poor Asian people, poor native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander people, poor all kinds of people. We do indeed need very vigorous anti-poverty strategies, but this is not an either or proposition. Because even if you were to give me a magic wand today where I could ding 
eliminate poverty, done. I would do it. And if with a ding, ding, a double ding, I could not only eliminate poverty, but equalize income, I would go all the way there. Yes, I would. But if I did that without addressing the background structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, the mechanisms of structural racism, if, even if I were to equalize income by race today, if I didn't address the mechanisms of structural or institutionalized racism in one generation, we would start to see a stratification by race again in terms of income. This is not an either or proposition, anti-poverty or anti-racism. This is a both and. And before I leave this level of racism, one more thing I need to say, which is that institutionalized or structural racism occurs through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. And very often it shows up as lack of action, inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism that I talk about, personal mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So this is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the different idea, the prejudice, and the different action, the discrimination. And many ways that it can impact health, police brutality, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just going to just freestyle for about 10 names. I mean, we, you know, I keep a list now on my phone that I call the sad list of names of black and brown men and women and indigenous and other men and women who have been killed by police officers who've come to national attention. There's so many that we don't even know about in our different localities. But Mr. George Floyd, very prominently right now, but Amadou Diallo back in 1999, you know, um, Mike Brown, uh, Laquan McDonald, Walter Scott, uh, Brianna Taylor, Sandra Bland. Oh my gosh, my mind is blanking. We don't even have the ones from the, the self-appointed neighborhood watch people like Tamir Rice, right? Or Ahmad Arbery. We have uh, Rayshard Brooks here in Atlanta and on and on and on. And as I say, these deaths, it's not just the loss of the potential. It's not just the family that has been irreparably harmed. There, this is affecting the health of whole communities whole communities who are just bracing ourselves for the next occurrence because for the most part there's been limited accountability by police officers or police departments for these killings. Physician disrespect, that's another manifestation of personally mediated racism. It can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician figures well that patient wouldn't understand or wouldn't comply or couldn't afford or whatever they assume or it could be quite blatant, like sterilization abuse, which has had many iterations in our nation's history. Shopkeeper vigilance being followed around in stores or waiter indifference, not getting quick respectful treatment. These are just two examples of what some people call everyday racism, the microaggressions, the subtle communication of disrespect that may underlie elevated blood pressures in communities of color, blood pressures that don't even come down at night. And teacher devaluation is a very important manifestation of personally mediated racism. Because if a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts that child off into the attention deficit disorder track, that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. Now, like structural racism, personally mediated racism can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing, but even more important is to recognize that personally mediated racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I'm depending on this slide from the point of view of members of stigmatized races as acceptance by members of stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Now, there are colleagues of mine who have challenged me and say, well, Kamara, what about the internalized sense of entitlement that many white people are walking around with? Isn't that also internalized racism? I agree, it is. And I don't have it on this slide because I haven't figured out how a sense of entitlement can turn into bad health outcomes. Although I will acknowledge that a sense of entitlement thwarted may be at the base of what some people are describing on the health side of things as um, the diseases of despair in white populations. So, you know, the suicides and op opioid epidemic and the like. But this slide, as I continue to talk, is from the point of view of members of stigmatized races where internalized racism turns into self-devaluation feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to that college or try to get that job or live in that neighborhood. 
It turns into the white man's ISIS colder syndrome, that phraseology I learned from my parents' generation and what it meant then for many people of color, it still means for many of us today. So say I'm black and I need a lawyer, I might actually seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or if I'm sick, I might prefer the white doctor over the black doctor if I could even find a black doctor. Or if my lemonade were warm, I might go way down the street to get the white man's eyes over the black man's eyes, deeply believing that the white man's eyes is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. Internalized racism shows up as resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors, turns into not registering to vote, not voting even if you are registered. And I just have to say, huh, people, 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 <laughs> there are such strong efforts to disenfranchise whole segments of our citizenry. We must make sure that all of us vote, that all of the, our friends and family vote, and each of us should take responsibility for making sure at least 10 people that we don't know vote, right? We cannot let this disenfranchisement stand. But getting back to internalized racism, it's really about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So that when we hear young high school students of color and one of them's trying to be the valedictorian and the others in the friend group are teasing her or him by saying, well, you know, so-and-so is just trying to be white. We need to challenge that because since when did white people claim exclusive access to excellence? They did not. So now I'm going to illustrate these three levels of racism and help us understand what we need to do to set things right by sharing another allegory based on my own real life experience. I call it levels of racism, a gardener's tale. And because I'm gonna be using, if you think I've been using my hands a lot already, I'm gonna be intentionally using my hands right now. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And let me first tell you about the thing that really happened to me. And then I'm gonna make it a story about racism. So my husband and I have been married about a year when we moved back down to Baltimore for me to finish my PhD at Hopkins. And we bought our first freestanding house, cute little house with a big wraparound porch with flower boxes dotted all on the porch. Now we bought this house in October, which in Baltimore is not the time to plant. So we waited, but when spring came, my husband who loves to garden ran out with our marigold seeds, gonna decorate our cute little house. And then he ran right back in. And he said, Kamara, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of the boxes are empty. So I need to go down to the gardening store. So he does, goes to the gardening store and he comes back hauling big old bags of potting soil. And so then we fill up those empty boxes with that potting soil. Then we take equal numbers of our marigold seeds put them in all of the boxes and we water all of the boxes equally. And by this time, I am not the gardener in the family, mind you, I'm exhausted. So I figure I'm just gonna sit back and be delighted. About three weeks later, I'm walking out of my front door. I finally pay attention to the flower boxes on my porch and I literally stop in my tracks because what I saw made me think that we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus others because some of the boxes were full of plants and they were tall, vigorous looking plants. And some of the boxes had just a few plants in them and they were kind of scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil that my husband had bought, that turned out to be rich fertile soil so that every single seed planted in the rich fertile soil had sprouted. The strong seed had grown very tall and vigorous but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. But that old soil that we have found there turned out to be poor rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor rocky soil just died. But even the strong seed in the poor rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. And some of you guys are nodding because you're, some of you guys are gardeners, right? And maybe you've composted half of your garden and maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes. And the image of course is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm gonna take this image and I'm gonna make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we're going to have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich fertile soil, one which she knows to have poor rocky soil, and she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms, and the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed, puts it in the rich fertile soil, pink seed in the poor rocky soil. Three weeks later in her flower boxes, she sees what I saw in mine. In that rich fertile soil, all the red seeds sprout, strong red seed, tall and vigorous, even the weak red seed makes it halfway up. In that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes a strong pink seed struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And the next year, same thing happens. 
And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, same thing happens until finally, oh, about 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we're gonna interrupt the story here to say the first part of this story is how institutionalized or structural racism works. Where you have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You have the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate. And then through lack of action, inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But let's pick the story back up to say, well, where is personally mediated racism in the garden? Well, the garden is looking at her flowers and she's looking at the red flowers and thinking, oh, those red flowers are so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, oh, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil. So she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers, excuse me, red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even understanding that they're benefiting from a rich soil. The pink flowers are looking over at red, thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, minding their own business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee bzz, into one of the pink flowers and then bzz, to another pink flower and then bzz, to this pink flower. And this flower's like, get away from me, bee. Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. So we can go over to the pink flowers and we can say pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is a very important intervention. But if that's all we do, it's not gonna change the situation in which those pink flowers find themselves. Or you might say, okay, okay. Well, let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. So we do, it's all good. So we have our workshop and in the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not gonna change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. If we really want to set things right in this garden, we must address the structural or institutionalized racism, which means we have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although it does make it easier for that same gardener to continue segregating resources going forward. But if you keep separate boxes, it means you need to enrich that poor rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand and glorious so that in that intervention on the institutionalized or structural racism, you will have also addressed the internalized racism because now pink will no longer be looking over at red thinking red is better or wanting to be red. And in that intervention, you may also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful will be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So this story has been to strongly suggest that if we want to set things right in the garden, we must at least address the structural racism, good to address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the structural. And when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. But there's actually one more question that we need to raise with regard to this story. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again. And da 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 da. That question is, who is the gardener? <laughs> right? Because I gave the gardener the power to decide, the power to act, and control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. So who is the gardener? Well, government is a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part of the gardener. Media, foundations, corporations, communities, to the extent they have self-determination. But whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity. When she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. And so our challenge is what do we do about the gardener? Do we make the gardener striped or polka dotted or fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? Lots of questions can come out of this story. And I'm going to break after I just share with you two questions that have come up before that I now share with everybody to whom I tell this story. But I want you, if you have questions, put them in the, in the Q&A function right now. But the first question that I was asked very early on in the telling of this story was, excuse me, Dr. Jones, but why should the red flowers share their soil? And when I heard that question, 
I loved that question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism, which might be otherwise difficult. We're talking about racism between you and me. My answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil, is that actually that soil doesn't belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. But here's a second question. What if that's not the original gardener we're looking at right there? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think that there's a problem to be solved. So very quickly in three steps, First, we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. We must put it on the agenda. The second is, what are we gonna do? It's on the agenda, now what are we gonna do? We must make those flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil so that we can address the differences in the quality of the soil. And the third thing is, as we make those flower boxes transparent, we must make sure that Everybody understands that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil. So we must talk about history and we must talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink set up the whole situation, right? Where that initial preference, some people call it cultural racism in our context is white supremacist ideology. We must address that because if we do not, even if we were to compel the red gardener to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it was as rich as the rich fertile soil, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So when I defined racism as a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value, for years I used to just talk about the quality of the soil with this story until I had that insight one day in the telling. I am always learning from this story and I hope to learn from some of your questions in a minute. But um, that we must address both the opportunity structure part and the value assignment part if we're gonna set things right in the garden. So now this is our pause for discussion again. So Dr. Harris. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for that. I love that story. So um, I just wanna let the audience know two things if they can um, use the question and answer feature because the, um, the chat feature is um, disabled. And secondly, that we are gonna be sharing this, this is recorded and we will be sharing it on our social media. So my first question from the audience is, what is the role that corporations should um, take in anti-racism? They should, so they should take the first role, the steps that we need to take, which is to name racism, ask how is racism operating here, which I haven't given you those tools for yet, and then organize and strategize to act. So I will say that the last little bundle of stuff that I'm gonna share is going to be to give you those tools for, for understanding how to ask how is racism operating here. So I'm just gonna hold on that for a second. Okay. And if I, if I haven't fully answered it to the satisfaction of whoever submitted that question, then we ask. Okay. okay. Um, so the second question is, can you tell us about how you have seen racial injustices change and or develop through, throughout your time in the medical and public health field? So has it changed <laughs> over time since you've joined the profession? Has racism changed? No. Racial injustice change in the medical. So ha about how have you seen racial injustices change and or develop throughout your time in the medical and the public health field? So I'm going to say that there are more people who are willing to say the word racism, but I, I, I as I warn that this might be another phase, you know, we've come and gone in phases. I will say that, um, that, you know, the Grady's in Atlanta, Georgia, which were two separate hospitals, one black and one white, are now Grady Hospital because of Medicare, mm -hmm. right, reimbursement. So that the, the tool was not that people felt, oh, now, now we should have the same kinds of resources. It was policy that was financial. Um, I will say that, um, you know, that so many of the things that, that the tools that we have are, are going to be in the space of, of policy stuff and structural stuff. Um, I will say that um, when in 2002, the unequal treatment report was released by the then Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, documenting uh, very clearly differences in quality of healthcare received within the healthcare system, that it sent shockwaves through the medical care 
uh, communities because people are like, oh, but I try to treat all of my patients equally, which points up the need for us to shine the bright light of inquiry in all of our practice in medicine and education and in law. Like, are we, uh, you know, we need to be unafraid to look at, at our own practice over six months or so, or look at the practice of, of our institutions um, to see if we're uh, doing the same thing equally for different people, or if we're even making ourselves available to people, you know, proportionately. So um, people are people are now, you know, doing the implicit association test to assess their unconscious bias. But I find that when they when people start talking about unconscious bias and they feel like they don't have to talk about racism anymore, and unconscious bias is part of that personally mediated racism stuff, right? The different idea and the different action, but the the system, you know, is what we need to address. Actually, I want to reserve five minutes at the end in questions and answers to, to share another allegory that I haven't even published yet or even, you know, I haven't made slides for it yet, but it's one to help us understand that the importance of communicating that racism is a system. So what have I seen? I've only had one life, um, right? And I know that, that, that there were changes before and things have gotten better and worse, you know, in the in the 1890s, you know, there were many, there were, you know, black senators and stuff, and there were black communities that were prospering. And then there was uh, what happened in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then, you know, in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 20s. So, so things, have, things have been waxing and waning for a lot. And that's because, and I'm going to share with you seven barriers that we need to, to address to start dismantling racism, but it's but part of it is that we're ahistorical and so we don't even understand what's come before us. So I would say racism is still here. Mm -hmm. It's alive and well, and it has different flavors across the country and it has different flavors in the medical and healthcare sector over time. The disparities have not changed. We had a whole effort you know, to eliminate racial ethnic health disparities by the year 2010, it was important. There was a lot of brain work and a lot of, it was an important framing because before with our healthy people agendas, if this were white infant mortality rate and this were black infant mortality rate in healthy people, which the first one in 1990, the goal was to do this. And then in healthy people 2000, the goal was to do this. It wasn't until healthy people 2010 that Dr. Satcher, the 16th Surgeon General said, well, the goal is to eliminate health disparities, not just to kind of do a little incremental shave on both, right? So this is important thing, but have we eliminated the disparities? No, because we are still, pruning this weed as opposed to getting to the root. Racism is the root cause of racial health disparities. And so until we say it, act on it and stay there for generations, we're not gonna do it. I recognize that my job is to create, give people tools for a national, uh, camp. So, so a national conversation about racism is how I used to think of it. And I used to think my kids would then embark on a national campaign against racism and their kids would then put in its place a system in which all people could know and develop to their full potentials. Given the platform I was given as president of APHA, I couldn't come out weak with a national campaign against racism. I mean, co conversation. So I went straight to campaign. Given what's happening in our country today, maybe we're going to short circuit that again. We have to go to the polls right now and we have to stay in the seats no matter who's elected. We need to be uh, very vigilant. We can't be, oh my God, we got a black president now with Obama. And then like, okay, you got this now for, you know, eight years, you got this and we didn't help him out. So, so it's a multi-generational thing. It's not a five-year plan. It's not a 20-year plan, but we have to stay at it. Absolutely. So I think we have time for one more question. Especially because um, I'm so long. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. right. Go ahead. That's all right. So this person says, I was raised to believe color was not something to be considered. It was about who the person was as a person. I was then told that I don't recognize my African American friends as black. I'm denying their identity. Help me to understand that. Okay, so, um, so first I'll make a distinction between so-called race, which in this country, I mean, yeah, so we are a race conscious society and ethnicities under those races. So when you talk about race, you don't even know something about a person's, you know, like full history or their language or culture or anything like that. People are born with history of parents and grandparents and all behind them. And they're born with ethnicity. We are assigned a race in this country. And somebody could come over here, Aboriginal from Australia and be called black, right? And, and, have, and, and there could be somebody, um, you know, like 
it, it's a, it, I, I don't even want to start going down there. But I, I will say that so race is different from ethnicity. African American is an ethnicity, right? And black is a so called race. Um, but then we've named ourselves so many different things throughout the ages. There, there are black Hispanic people, right, and come from Dominican Republic or whatever, who get here and they can't even express their their Hispanic part because the social interpretation how they look is black, right? I mean, there's so many things. So, so first, um, so the, your parents who said you weren't supposed to see color were trying to say that we have to recognize the full humanity in all of us. But that full humanity includes the, the racialized society in which we live, right? So yes, we should all aim to see the full humanity, but we have to acknowledge the context of our lives, which is one that racializes most of us. White people still walk around most often thinking that they're fully human and not really understanding whiteness as some kind of um, constraint. If anything, it's uh, you know, an entitlement type of thing. Um, I'll just say one thing that we developed when I was at CDC, we developed some questions, six questions on a reactions to race module that were available to all of the states on their behavior risk factor surveillance system. And one question was, how often do you think about your race? Would you say never, once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day, once an hour or constantly? And in the first year that that survey was just piloted in six states, we looked at that 60% of people who were usually classified by others as white, because we also had a question, how do other people usually classify you in this country? 60% said they never thought about their race. 60% of people who were either usually classified by others as Hispanic or black thought about their race once a day or more frequently. That is an eternity of experience apart. To not understand that eternity of experience apart, to not understand that we are living in a in a society that racializes people, that is a racist society that structures opportunity and assigns value is to miss like the big part of people who's <laughs> their experience. So you have to acknowledge your friend's experience even though you also want to accord them their full humanity. I hope that that was a sort of clearish answer. I think so, thank you. Okay, so I am going to jump back into my slides. I want to, uh, woo, I'm gonna talk really fast. because I do want to be, uh, keep a little bit more time for questions at the end. This is now, you know, so I talked about a national campaign against racism with three tasks, to name racism, the second to be asking how is racism operating here to identify levers for intervention, the third to organize and strategize to act. This question, how is racism operating here is a legitimate question because racism is not a cloud or a miasma that we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, which are actually different elements of decision-making, where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, especially who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. And whenever you find yourself at a decision-making table, I charge you henceforth, to take a look around and say, well, who's not here who has an interest in this proceeding? And then your job is not just to represent their interests, although you might have to do that in the short term, your job is to create space to find them a way to the table. And if structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, policies are the written how of decision-making, practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision-making, and values are the why. And I encourage us to take this question with us everywhere. How is racism operating here at Boston College? How is racism operating in my child's school? How is racism operating in my neighborhood? How is racism operating with regard to police killings of unarmed Black and Brown men and women, where structures include the or presence of civilian review boards to you know, monitor police practice and hold police departments accountable. Policies include the reliance on grand juries to indict police officers. Not enough that you just strafed a, uh, a, an apartment with bullets and the person ends up dead. No, you need a grand jury to do something about that. Or some of the provisions in the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which allow people who've been found to, a lot of you know, police officers have been found to have wrongdoing in one place to not have that, that record follow them to another district. Practices including the over-policing of communities of color, which causes more accidental interaction, or no-knock warrants or chokeholds. Practice, I mean, the norms of the blue code of silence, which is like if a police officer sees another officer doing something wrong, oh, they just didn't see anything. 
And I understand that many departments are now mandating, not only do you have to say something if you see something wrong, if you're there and you can do something, you need to act. That's positive. And values, the values including the view of black men as inherently threatening. So if a police officer says, well, it was a black man, I feared for my life, then you get like, oh yeah, I got that. <laughs> or the dehumanization of people of color. What about how is racism operating here with regard to excess deaths of black and indigenous and Latinx and Pacific Islander and other people of color from COVID-19 where what's happening is in like two buckets. First of all, we're more likely to become infected because we're more exposed and less protected. And once infected, we're more likely to die because we're more burdened by chronic diseases with less access to health care. Well, how is racism operating here? Well, racial segregation into disinvested communities. So not only is it that the housing is crowded and all, and then if somebody is infected, then they infect everybody else in the household. Not only is it that the public schools are based on property taxes in most communities still. And so if you have a poor community, you have poorly financed schools, which often turn into poor educational outcomes and another whole generation loss, which turns into people being overrepresented in these frontline, uh, you know, uh, jobs, you know, that are poorly protected, but, you know, these essential jobs that are where people are actually being treated as if they were disposable, all of that, or disproportionate incarceration, black and brown people more likely to be in prisons and jails and detention centers and the like. So that has to do with the exposure, but it also the, the being concentrated in disinvested communities is also the root cause of why we're more burdened by chronic diseases. Policies that limit, you know, of limited personal protective equipment for low wage essential workers or limited paid sick leave or, you know, no family medical leave act, you no, know, not even hazard pay. The fact that we are not using universal basic income as a strategy to pay people to stay home, right? And we're not using the, the president hasn't invoked the Defense Production Act for the production of masks or other personal protective equipment or even tests to protect the people who are truly essential, not just essential because they don't have paid sick leave. The practices that we've had about testing in terms of the early placement of and continued testing of placement of testing centers and even our strategy which treats COVID-19 as if it were an individual medical problem as opposed to a public health problem. I could talk for an hour on that, so I'm not going to stay there. The norms that of our narrow focus on the individual, which makes systems and structures invisible or irrelevant, or our a historical stance, we act as if the present were disconnected from the past, or the myth of meritocracy that if you work hard, you make it, which all support staunch racism denial so that when we see people of color overrepresented in COVID populations, some people think, well, oh, they're, they're more susceptible, or they just really didn't think that it could affect them. They just, they didn't know what to do or whatever, as opposed to understanding that COVID-19 actually pulled the sheets off of structured racism in US society. And the values that are even being written into our crisis standards of care, those policy statements being written by health systems or even by states about what we're going to do if we have one ventilator left and 10 people who need it, where the existence of chronic diseases in many of these crisis standards of care either disqualify people straight out for that last ventilator or put them lower on the priority list, where we are actually writing the impact of racism on health into the access to life-saving therapies. There, I used to describe seven, I used to call them barriers to achieving health equity, um, you know, societal barriers or cultural barriers. I'm, I now recognize these to be the seven values targets for anti-racism action. We understand a lot about structural targets for anti-racism action. So, you know, we have to do something about disproportionate incarceration. We need to do something about residential segregation and the disinvestment and all of that and how we fund public schools. But the values piece has been kind of like not clear. So I'm going to make it clear now. The first is in this country, we're so narrowly focused on the individual that yes, it makes systems and structures either invisible or seemingly irrelevant, but it also makes our sense of self-interest very narrowly defined. We're not even counting our aunts and uncles and cousins as part of self, much less the people who live on the other side of town. It limits our idea of interdependence, there but for the grace of God go I. We're all in this together. I am my brother's and sister's keeper. It limits our sense of collective efficacy because we're asking the wrong question. We're asking, well, what can I do about racism? As opposed to asking, what can we do? 
The second is fact that we're ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. That's, that's problematic. It also means that if you're ahistorical, you were born and things were a certain way, you think they've always been this way and always need to stay this way. So it even limits our idea about how we can cause change in structures and systems. We would do well to study the history of successful social change right about now in our nation. The myth of meritocracy, the story that goes something like this, if you work hard, you'll make it. Now I give you, most people who have made it have worked hard. Not everybody who's made it has worked hard. We have some prominent examples of that, but most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field that has been structured by racism, sexism, heterosexism, all of these capitalism, all these systems of structured inequity. And when we deny those systems, then we are endorsing the myth of meritocracy and blaming people who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid. And there are many ways to deny racism. You could say, I don't think racism exists. We've heard some people say that, right? Or you could never say the word racism. Because if you never say the word racism, even though you're talking about disparities and disproportionalities or diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, cultural competence, structural competence, you could talk about race, all these things. If you never say the whole word racism and get the ism out of your mouth in the context of widespread denial, you are complicit with that denial. The fourth of these values targets is our myth of the zero sum game, that if you gain, I lose, which puts us in competition with what one another as opposed to cooperation, it masks the fact that racism and these other systems sap the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources and actually also through dividing people and separating people from their own interests. It masks, it hinders efforts to grow the pie. And it's almost like I'm sitting at a potluck dinner. I see you coming and I do not want you to come over here because I think you're going to eat up all the food. And I don't even recognize that you're bringing all kinds of cakes and pies and roasts and salads and fruits and all kinds of good stuff with you because I don't even value you. The fifth of these seven values targets is our limited future orientation. So in this, anywhere, for any of us, the part of the future that we can touch are the children and the planet. In this country, we have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. We do not, like many American Indian nations do, we do not have a seven generations hence view when we're trying to make policy decisions. What's gonna be the impact in a hundred years? Nor do we like, I understand Maasai people do, you know, when they greet one another, they don't say, hey, how you doing? They ask the question, how are the children? And they hope to hear the answer back. All the children are well. We don't even ask how the children are in this country. And if we did, we would not get the answer that all the children are well. The sixth of these seven is the myth of American exceptionalism, that in this country, we are so special, so different, so ordained by God, that the usual rules don't apply to us, that we don't have to be concerned about what other people are doing elsewhere in the world. And in fact, that there's nothing that we can learn from what other people are doing in other countries. And oh, if we could only learn what people have been doing in other countries to, to address this COVID pandemic, there would be so many tens of thousands of lives saved. Finally, the seventh is actually the first, the foundational one, white supremacist ideology. And I don't say that as a lightning rod term. I say it as a description of a false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race. There is no hierarchy of human valuation by race. And the falser notion that if there were, that white people would be at the top as the ideal or the norm. But there are many people in this country who hold this false idea, this white supremacist ideology. It gives, uh, some people who are living as white, a sense of entitlement. It results in the dehumanization of people of color and fear at the browning of America, that fear that's underlying a lot of our political divide today. So what can we do today? Going back to the image from the restaurant, we need to actively look for evidence of two-sided signs. Is there something differential going on here by race or gender or language or immigration status or religion or urban rural or anything? We need to look not only at outcomes, but also at opportunities, right? Um, and not sit back and say, oh, well, it looks open to me. We need to burst through our bubbles to experience our common humanity in different circumstances. Each of us is in a bubble of experience. Some are small with thick plexiglass, boundaries, some are bigger with, you know, thin soap bubbles, but whatever kind of bubble we're living in, most of us do not know that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who have, who are living in very different circumstances. We as individuals and as institutions need to foster bubble bursting so we can experience our common humanity in 
different circumstances so we can start building common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others and then believe the stories of others and then join in the stories of others. We need to develop a sensitivity to the absence of who is not at the table, what is not on the agenda, what policy is not in place that if put in place could be quite productive. And we especially need to reveal inaction in the face of need because that's how structural racism most often manifests these days. But all of the work to do and all of the power is not actually all inside the restaurant. Those of us on the outside, we need to know our power. And we need to recognize that action is power and especially that collective action is power. So I am delighted that I saved just a few minutes for questions. So I, I'm gonna just word answers to the questions you asked me now. I'm not gonna go into a whole treatise. Is there any time for questions or we have to go to a close? Um, I think we have a time for one question. And so um, this question is, what do you believe the role of the nursing, medical, or social work student is in addressing and combating racial inequity in healthcare? And how can we be most effective in doing so? So I think um, it's at different levels. I think in your day job, you need to recognize uh, when racism is happening, you need to understand, you have to treat all. Uh, all of your patients with respect. So, so these things about valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustice, it's even in your little way and, and providing resources according to need, you know, not equally, but according to need. Those can be principles, not just in the big way, but in your daily job. I think you need to create common, a, a, a bond of common humanity with your patients by just talking to them and, you know, finding out something about it. If you just talk to anybody on a well, we used to sit next to each other on buses and planes and park benches. We're not doing that anymore. But when we did, you know, you could just, if you, within two minutes, you can find something in common with any person on this earth. So do that with your patients and then listen to them carefully and don't make assumptions about what they would or wouldn't do. Don't constrain um, the kinds of treatments that you would consider for them. Don't make assumptions about them and their lives. I mean, treat them as if they were your mother or your sister or your father or your brother or your child um, to have full respect. So I think it starts there, but then, and you need to figure out what other resources are around. I do this whole cliff analogy where, you know, we have ambulances at the bottom of the cliff, but even if you're an ambulance driver at the bottom of the cliff, you need to wonder, is there a net above you that's catching people before they get splashed at the bottom? Is there a fence at the edge of the cliff? How close is the population to the edge of the cliff, right? Um, and you know, how strong is the fence? How close is the population? At what part of the cliff you're operating? So, so even if you're an ambulance driver as a nursing student, as a citizen, we need to all be ad about addressing the three dimensionality of the cliff, which is all about, it's been structured and being perpetuated by racism, sexism, all these other things. So you have your day job stuff, you do it there. And then you have your citizen stuff, not national citizen, but global citizen, earth citizen, where you try to address racism by naming it, asking how is racism operating here in all of your settings, and then organizing and strategizing to act. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Dr. Jones. I really appreciate it. So I would like to invite um, Dean Gennaro and Dean Rigeau to turn back on your video for the re remaining minutes of tonight's events. Anybody who's still here, I just want to say one more. Can I say one more thing that I wanted to say? Sure. I wanted to go back to the four key messages. Name racism, uh, when we are naming racism, that racism exists, that racism is a system, racism saps the strength of the whole society, and we can act to dismantle racism. I just wish I had said that at the end. But anyway, for those last ones who are still here. And I'd like to thank Dean Gennaro, Jean Rougeau, and all of you in the audience for participating in, in such an insightful and spirited conversation. It's inspiring to see, to see so many members of the greater Boston College community who are engaged in and committed to finding solutions to the issues of social justice discussed here tonight. And to Dr. Jones, I wanna thank you for not only sharing your experiences and understanding, but sharing actionable strategies as well. Your work is truly empowering. And so in closing, I would like to say to everybody, please join the Forum on Racial Justice in America and CSUN for our upcoming events, which we'll link to in our closing slide and stay up to date on all the upcoming um, Boston College 
college events by visiting www.bc.edu backslash events. Thank you again. And I'd like to wish everybody a, a really good night. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good evening, everyone.